Imagine entering a new office, seeing these huge and fancy dashboards with lots of gouges, lots of bars, lots of numbers, graphs and everything. You look at it, you think, wow, so cool. It looks like a cockpit of an aircraft. I want to work here. You join that company, takes you a month or two to realize you'll never actually use that. And then you realize nobody is actually using that. And then you realize nobody even knows what the hell it means. Some dude coded it and left a year ago and we just kept it there because it looks cool, you know, it adds this, like we see everything in our fancy office. And that is nothing wrong with that. Like we, we like to look cool, why not? I mean, in fact, if, if you are about this aircraft thing, you can even code in a pilot's uniform if, if that like gives you a kick. But okay, now let's be real. Maybe we should leave those uniforms rather for the like, after work entertainment. And when it comes to coding, let's focus on solving real problems and putting some real telemetry data on those screens of yours. So my name is Anton. I live in Munich, Germany. I love organizing events. I run a meetup by Munich and I made several conferences in Munich. I run an agency there as well and yeah, my like, customer mistakes is my business. So I love these dashboards, especially when they are useless, especially when I need to spend months digging in the data to get some sense of that. Uh, about the events, like uh, speaking of EuroPython, it's a huge, nice conference. Um, a big credit to uh, the, all of the talks that have been so far. Also, the open telemetry talk from yesterday was good. I have to be creative. I need to take a step back, rethink the whole thing. And I want to share a story with you like from the very, very beginning. Let's forget everything we know about the observability. Let's go back to the primitive ways of see how our software behaves. And then we go step by step to open telemetry and then we see how it should be done in the best case perfection. What is telemetry in the first place? Like me, myself, I got into like introduction in the world of telemetry uh, when I got into like RC worlds, so, like RC cars, drones and so on. And then think what is the difference in driving an RC car and flying an RC drone? Well, the car is easy. Like you just see it and you drive it and you don't really need any feedback. But totally different thing about the drone. It's not enough to see the drone. You need to see what the drone sees, and you need to feel what the drone feels. And this feedback is telemetry. When it comes to telemetry in drones, it is essential to put all the important things on this little screen that is there. So it's, it also has all the data from the sensors, like a compass, accelerometers, position, a video feed, obviously, battery level, obviously. But you need to be selective. You need to only display what is really important for you in that moment. And we forget this part in software oftentimes. We just gather everything, put it in those fancy dashboards. In result, we have something like this, which would probably wouldn't fly quite long with, with that kind of feed if you fly a drone, but in software we can afford it. So this is my criticism about the dashboards as I see them in every client, like really every. If they have something, then it's something that either Datadog or New Relic or any other company sells them. We just put a lot of nice graphs and never actually think about it. They mix the technical data with the business data, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, what are the purchases of some product of today's subscription numbers, along with response times and the server CPU load. This rarely makes any sense, to be honest. Like there are, honestly, there are two factors that should be there usually from the standard tool set. It's the response time. If you have like request response cycle, you need that and you need probably RAM and CPU and that's it. So let's take a step back and start from really from scratch. Like what feedback do we need from our software to understand how it runs? Well, first of all, we need to see if it runs at all. LEDs were the first indicator for that. Like you look at your Wi-Fi router, if Wi-Fi is blinking, it works. It is some sort of observability, it's, it is some sort of telemetry. Then those who had, not MacBooks, but older laptops know a very, very important uh, telemetry information. That's when your fan's starting to spin. It means it's now difficult for that guy. It's, it is now something serious. And some of you also know how the hard drive sounds. When you say zzzz, then you say, aha, reading the data. It is some sort of feedback from your software. It's primitive, 
But back then it was enough for us to understand if this thing is just hanging or if it's actually running. So I count it as a, some sort of primitive observability. Now then we of course have to speak about logs. Logging is another, like the, probably the most common way to give feedback to developers of how the software runs. Something was broken and we do not know what exactly. So we start doing this. And I know that you did it. I, I just know, I see it. Well, okay, some of you are perfectionists and you did something like this. I know that too, been there. And then we, when we wanted to go like the next step and take some really, really advanced level of uh, logging and observability and we added some metrics, we also did this before and after to see how long it took. Well, as primitive as it is, it was the first step to the real problem. Like we wanted to know how long the thing takes and we want to see it in numbers, so we just use timing to, to see the difference. It makes me feel like in warm old good times when I show this, because it was good times before we went to this with our software and the microservices. Now with this kind of software architecture, it's not possible anymore to just get around with this nice and warm logging. We cannot really skim through the logs of dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of microservices running in our infrastructure. So think of it this way, like there was a step somewhere in your career as a Python developer, when instead of writing print, you started writing logging.info. Been there, and that's when you become senior developer. <laughs> well, now it's the time to be exceptional developer and take the next step. Now logging is apparently not enough. Now we need to introduce proper observability in our software, and that is open telemetry. Like, this is a trendy topic, although it's relatively new. Uh, I think it was 2023, so just last year when they were complete with the features that they wanted after the merger of uh, open tracing and open census. So it's fresh, but it's already trendy. And we can name, and we will name, advantages of using open telemetry, but there should be just one that is important. It's a standard now. It's a, it's a standard protocol that everybody either is using or will be using in the nearest future. So this is the next logging.info, uh, open telemetry agents, and the way we send the metrics is the new way that we send logs, basically, uh, to observe our software. Uh, I already mentioned uh, open tracing and open census. I know there are, this is not the single and only option to send uh, observability data somewhere, dozens of them. Like, I think the first one I tried was New Relic. Uh, but it is a standard one, and it's not just standard one because somebody claimed it will be standard, it's because two major platforms merged together, Open Tracing and Open Census. Open Census, I think it's from Google. Uh, there are quite a bunch of big players, I think Uber as well, that are behind this project. So many big companies agreed, okay, now we do this, and they took two different products that, in fact, not so much compete, but complete each other. And they announced that they will be working on the next version of these two. They call it Open Telemetry, and it will implement all of the features of both. So it seems like a win-win today. So today, Open Telemetry exists in more than 10 languages, I think. Obviously, Python being probably, if not, then one of the most important ones. All of new things are in Python client right away. And there is like hundreds of integrations with everything, meaning it's good that we can uh, use agents as we've uh, heard of the talk of from yesterday in Python, in PHP, in JavaScript to collect telemetry data from our applications, but it's even better than many things like standard databases, key value stores and so on already speak the protocol, so this you get for free. It's not just your software, it's also all of the infrastructure around it, which is either already speaking Opal telemetry protocol or will be doing that very, very soon. So I will summarize like really quick, uh, I don't want to stop here much. It's of course a unified way because it's a standard. So how can we uh, take a single framework and collect all of the data there? Then it's uh, inter interoperability, uh, uh, which means there are like a big, big range of both programming languages and tools on the market that speak that protocol and rich context. And by that, I mean that we collect uh, traces, metrics, logs, uh, which are essentially different things, but we collect them in one system, which is, makes the whole thing much easier. Now let's get more um, in depth, finally. 
So what are the bases of open telemetry? There are traces, metrics, and logs. What are the traces? I mean, I don't want really to repeat everything from yesterday, but I need to give you some sort of the update. So yeah, trace is the way that we recognize that one request from the user, let's say, came to some entry point of our system and made this whole way through a bunch of microservices and somewhere on the way a failure might, might happen or not, but we need to be able to connect all of these dots, how the requests went, and that is a trace. Then metrics is usually quantitative data, like uh, this is when we want to record uh, usually seconds of how long something took, but can be any, any, uh, any metric that you want to submit to some system like probably Prometheus, uh, the most popular one. And then logs, well, we all know what are logs, we love logs, I love logs. Uh, logs are more of uh, tailored to the use case, I think. We usually use logs when we know what can go wrong, so it's about the fact. So log is just the fact that something happened or some process is running or not running. They're nice, but they're less flexible and they are honestly useless if the system is huge and we don't know what happened because it happened the first time, yet it is in production, so we need to dig in. Then we need to combine it with traces and metrics. Um, now a bit about the infrastructure of how these signals work. So there are these five steps, five pillars, so to say. There is instrumentations. That is what your application is running. These are the components of your application that takes the OpenTelemetry SDK or other compatible libraries which generate the telemetry data. Then there is a collection. Uh, the telemetry data has to be sent to the collector somehow. And then depending on the setup, it can be your application doing it in a native way or it can be a sidecar that runs some agent on the same host and uh, it collects the telemetry data for you. Then there is processing. Uh, we need to process the data we receive because we receive way too much data usually and not necessarily all of it we want to store somewhere. Finally, exporting is the part where we send the data to the backends that we want to use. Because it's a standard thing, open telemetry, it's not bound to just one system to be um, gathering, uh, storing, and displaying your data. It can be anything you want. It can be, in fact, Datadog or all of these most popular observability platforms out there, they do support open telemetry. Or it can be your little Prometheus, uh, Grafana, whatever you like. And finally, there is a last piece, this analysis and visualization. This is not really a piece where open telemetry rocks, in my opinion. We do have common tools there, but as I say, it's freedom, it's standard protocol, just plug in any tool you like, done. Uh, I just visualized it really quick to, yeah, it is the same thing, so step one, instrumentation, it's your application that generates the data, this telemetry data is set to the collector. Collector has to receive it, then process, like filter by, if necessary, or batch it and then export, and then I, I wrote it for the exporting. Down there you have like, one system can be for tracing, another can be for metrics and alerts, another one can be for log management, and so on and so forth. And then it's up to you how you want to visualize it. Now let's go to the real use cases now. The first one is the simplest one. Say so you have your software already, and you need to, you just, maybe it's some old legacy code, you don't really want to invest time into implementing best observability patterns there, but you still want it to report something to be a part of your system on your dashboard. So the easiest way is to use uh, just a standard uh, auto-instrumentation agent over there. It's so just quickly adding tracing to the application without needing to change the application code itself. As you see, this is just the way you start Python program. It allows you to integrate observability into your development development really rapidly, and this is uh, the advantage of it. Of course, nothing comes for free. You will not get any serious insights with this, and it will cost you something. So by using this, which is kind of a wrapper, you will sacrifice a bit of performance. So I'm not sure this has to be running in production. It's about you, and just test it. Next use case is also one of the easy use cases uh, for us because, as I mentioned, OpenTelemetry supports a wide range of uh, the frameworks, uh, platforms, and so on. So if you're using a popular framework like Django, Flask, anything, it's almost guaranteed that you will already have some um, uh, auto-instrumentation integrated for your specific framework out of the box in your Python client. So in this example, uh, I show how it works for Flask. This is really like 
three lines of code. I know that three lines is not one line, one line would be cooler, but we had to sacrifice this when we switched from print to logging anyway, because we have to import logging and set the log level. So this is, I guess, the next step into our routine. I listed all integrations here, small font on purpose, so that you just make, just to make you believe that there is lots of them, and probably your, your project is somewhere there. Now we're finally getting to custom instrumentation. So beyond the automatic instrumentation, custom instrumentation allows us to tailor the telemetry data to the specific needs of our application. For example, we can manually instrument some Python microservice to trace critical but maybe not so standard operations like uh, some dynamic feature toggles or some complex algorithmic decision points. And the benefit, of course, is that it provides detailed insights for this part of application that are guaranteed not covered by the automatic instrumentation or the framework instrumentation. Uh, let's take a look at the code. I hope you can see it. This is really easy because it integrates with Python really nicely. You can guess what it does by just looking at the code. It's also using the context manager, so just whiz, tracer, start a span. I never mentioned what a span is. A span is a piece of a trace. So when uh, you are tracing the whole thing, one microservice is creating one span of the data. Yeah, uh, this is how you use it. Uh, you just set, uh, get, get, uh, you, you take the tracer, you get the current span, and you set whatever attributes you like or whatever metrics you like. Um, okay, with this I want to mention also the use case of a, which is a bit more, yeah, not standard, that when you need to configure the exporter. Because yeah, one, one thing is a bit, in the beginning, a bit confusing in open telemetry, that you have not just one component like logger, you have many. Uh, you have a tracer, you have exporter. Yeah. And in, in this case, I'm showing you batch span processor, and this is really simple, because the only thing it does is it allows you to batch your spans together. This is for optimizing network. Just, just that, so because in the standard way, you will send the data all the time, probably you don't want it, especially on production all the time, so it will batch it and then send it in batches. Mm -hmm. And speaking of this data processing, I will also uh, quickly mention filtering. Again, not usually have the same code deployed for testing, staging, and production. While it makes sense to log everything in some of these systems, it probably does not make sense to log everything across all of the systems. So you can configure filtering for production or for testing or maybe even for like uh, sensitive data. What do you want to filter out uh, of the telemetry data that you sent? This is the way you do it. We will have a little demo right now, so I will not stop, I guess, on the code much. I think it's also self-explanatory. I have uh, on start and on end hooks where you define what exactly you want to export. Okay, we still have, we still have time for demo, which is good. Demo. I need to turn on mirroring. Mirror. All right, we'll need to play with the font size, I guess. Good. Anyone knows how to increase the font in the iTerm? Like this, okay, good. So I have a sample app here. Okay, maybe I open it in PyCharm. Will be easier. Okay. Also in a bigger font. Good. Imagine a minimalistic microservice that you have. Uh, just one uh, URL, get weather. It gets a location from the arguments. It, uh, yeah, this is like a response mock, obviously. It does some requests, just imagine that. It returns JSON of the weather data. Uh, that's it. Let's run it. Okay, running. Um, making it bigger too. Okay. Works. Now we want to integrate the Open Telemetry protocol here, and we want to start easy and then not so easy. So, starting easy is 
turning your app into this. Now we need to go on the code. So let's skip the imports because that's boring. We need to initiate the trace provider. Then we need to add a span processor and uh, our span processor is just a console exporter, meaning that we want to see it in the console. I'm not running any backend right now on this laptop, so everything that it can collect just prints to the console. And the magic happens here. We use Flask Instrumenter just to automatically instrument the app. And yeah, it hooks into the framework uh, and it will just log uh, main things like IPs, headers, and timings. So that's it. Um, I will also speak about this later, but for now let's just trace it as it is. Okay, so I made the request again, but this time we see a lot of tracing data here in the console. So, so this is what OpenTelemetry sends you with a Flask instrumenter by default. Let me go to the beginning. I guess it's too much information. We probably don't need it. Important things are trace ID, span ID to identify the trace because we will have many components like this running in our backend. The timing, of course, because it's a HTTP thingy, you have statuses, headers, and everything. You have events that happened. Uh, yeah, uh, the SDK data and so on, the URL, obviously. And all of the attributes of a request over here as well. Good. Now jumping back to the code, you see I also used here with statement, so I explicitly set this to be a separate span, get weather operation, because I don't want to rely fully on the automatic Flask instrumenter um, for, for Flask, one URL is just one span. For me, maybe in one URL, many things happen. So if I want to split uh, like one endpoint and trace it more fine-grained into really smaller pieces of code, what is happening here, what is happening here, this is super easy just with this, just using the with statement. Uh, yeah. Then we can set custom attributes on span here like this. Add event, this is what happened. So this is your new logging info. This is the same thing that you want to indicate that something happened, you usually log it, and now you set it as an event. Okay, two minutes, that's fine. Yeah, okay, then we have to jump to more advanced scenario. And the main difference here, we will not go over everything, is that now we use open telemetry protocol exporter and we do want to export it not just to console but to the actual backend. So we don't, we will not go over everything really, but let me just start it. Okay, now it should complain. I made the request, but there is no backend running, so it says unavailable, so there is some problem. And this is a part of a demo just to show you how easy it is to start one. You can just use Docker Compose. You use Jaeger, a uh, standard tool coming with OpenTelemetry for visualization. Uh, we will not go into Jaeger, I'll just show you a screenshot now, but it runs and now there will be no error anymore because now uh, we have our backend running was as easy as Docker Compose up. Okay, let's jump quickly back to the presentation then to finish it. Demo is done. Yeah, about Jaeger, it's very important to understand that this is not like Jagger. it's not Mick Jagger. It's Jaeger like a hunter in German, so uh, hence the logo, I guess. Uh, this is how it looks like. This is just a screenshot from their documentation. So when you report all of this data that you gathered with OpenTelemetry and you use Jaeger, which is kind of a standard visualization backend that comes bundled with it, no, not really bundled, but like recommended, so to say. Uh, then this is what you see. These are your processes, spans happening in your system. This is what you will see there. And one alternative to that is Zipkin. I think it's made by Twitter, which does absolutely the same thing. Up to you. Good. Um, yeah, we had to skip a lot, but I think we are in perfect timing, though. So I say, I say a big thank you.
fun. Yeah, and thank you, Anton, for this. Uh, time flies when we're having fun. But luckily, we also get time for questions. So let's start. We have a question from the public here. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, so your examples are mainly concerned uh, with web applications, right? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to instrument a CLI app, for example? So an app that, uh, let's say, a user would run locally on their computer, and I would like to get information about you know, the most common commands that they are running, the arguments that they're providing, et cetera. Is it possible? And if so, what sort of setup would you recommend uh, to instrument a CLI app? It is absolutely possible, but you will most likely need custom instrumentation for that, which is not complicated. As I say, this WIS statement covers most of your needs automatically, the first thing. And then it's important to understand why did I choose uh, HTTP as an example, because the most of the mess comes from these distributed systems with dozens of microservices. This is where the mess usually happens. If it's really a console application, it could well be that uh, out of all of that, you will only need some basic metrics and logs. Uh, usually, it's a rare case when one terminal app will call another terminal app in a chain so that you need to pass trace IDs all over to see the whole chain of events. Unlikely. So it makes everything much more simple, which is good. And you have to use not standard way, so manual instrumentation, but that is not bad because it's simple. So you just use this with. Um, uh, if you want to send some custom metrics that you mentioned, you just use span dot and whatever. It's really standard things uh, in the Python agent. Uh, yeah, so it is absolutely possible. As you do not need to copy everything that is important in the web app or uh, let's say any distributed app could be web sockets, could be message queue in between. If you have a simpler use case, also don't overcomplicate it. Plug it in and send just the data you need uh, manually, but there will be much less work anyway. So, cool. Thank you for the question. Do we have any more? Maybe the question is what's for lunch? Yeah. Well, we've got one, <laughs> probably different one as <laughs> well. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, thanks for the talk. Is it not like really, really putting a lot of pressure into your code? Like you are asking for the problem because if something happens on the side of open telemetry, like you, it's very obtrusive. I'm scared of that. And on the other side, there are some known techniques like, I don't know, you're adding some unique ID to your, all your requests and then everything happens magically in, in some middleware and your code stays clean. Like this is very obtrusive. What are your ideas about it? It is. It is. Uh, well, the good, the good thing, though, that it is decoupled and distributed. So if something is wrong with your backend in Opel Telemetry, nothing happens because the collector will just collect the things as normal and the exporter will just batch it and keep it. And will, like I showed in my demo, you will see the errors that, well, I have nowhere to send the data because your backend is down. It's not a problem as soon as it gets up the data will be sent. So you really do not have this blocking problem that if the open telemetry backend is down, the whole system is down. So I wouldn't say that this is a problem, but that it's obtrusive, yeah, it is. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, by design, there is, uh, apart from the automatic instrumenter of like Flask or Django, where you know it, it's about request response cycle, and you know standard things to log are the request parameters, there, the framework or SDK or Python agent, agent can do the guessing for you. But like in the previous question, if it's some terminal script, some Python shell script, there is no way the system can guess what data you need. And then you need to make your code ugly to specify what exactly are those uh, important markers uh, of your system. But was it not possible to get away with a custom logger and use logging for that? Yes, but logging is a part of open telemetry. So it gathers logs as well, but logs will not give you timings, for instance, like how long something took. Logs will not give you, yeah, you can parse it out of logs usually, of course, but it's just even more work, in my opinion. You will need some Kibana and some parsing uh, of your logs to have the same thing that you can just send very explicitly right from the software. It's a thing of a taste, but then it's again about the future. Uh, if you do just that, you will not have it integrated with other systems that probably run. Very unlikely you have just a Python script running. Most likely you have some cache, or I don't know, and then it can all come together. Like you can do a, a user request something from your app, and you can see not only what happens in your 
Python code, but also for that exactly same request, what happened in the cache backend, what happened in the database, and so on. So in, I think in the long run, it pays off. I hate to make my code more complicated than it should be, and it, it, it does. <laughs> That's true. Uh, for serious systems, which are like production 24-7, I think there is no way around it, to be honest. Thanks for the insight. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for one more. Yeah. Just, just to complete uh, the answer for the for the previous question, the things that usually you are using um, manual instrumentation when you need like something pretty specific. Um, well, people on production, well, they usually use is uh, the automatic instrumentation for different uh, and libraries or things that they are using. So usually this thing is not as intrusive when you are doing your code. Just when you need like something pretty customized, right? Uh, also, the things that the people who wrote the auto instrumentation libraries are pretty smart, and usually they did in a way that they report the data and everything else in a, a separate thread or something like that, right? So it's your data or the the, the workloads that you are running are not compromised. Uh, also, you can set up things like uh, increasing the timeouts and things like that, right? Um, and well, uh, usually you send everything to maybe an open terminal collector or something like that. So usually you modify everything from there not directly from the from the applications, right? So with that, you can customize everything from a single point without touching your your applications. So it's less intrusive that it seems. So yeah. Big thanks to my assistant. <laughs> thank you for that. OK, so Anton survived the live coding session and the talk. So thank you very much for that. A big hand for Anton. Thank you.